Okay. Bear with me, saints. We are on our way, dear. And <laughs> okay. Well, if it can, it will. Well, we thank God. Um, there we go. We thank God for this opportunity we have to come before the throne of grace, saints. Go with me. Um. Because of our time, we're going to actually want to please move swiftly, expeditiously with me. Go with me to the book of Acts. Bible study, we pray to God that everyone is um, geared up, ready to go. Everybody's doing what they're supposed to do. God will win every single time. So, we're going to be coming from Acts. And we had finished up Acts, the 23rd chapter. And what we're going to do is our ever-loving slingshot effect. We're going to touch that which was and get into what it's going to be. So with that said, let us go before the throne of grace in prayer. Father, we bless you. We thank you and we honor you for this opportunity. You have given us once again to come before the throne of grace. We thank you, Lord, that there's nothing that we possibly could do in any way, form, or fashion, Lord, to give us such a privilege. But it's your mercy, your love, and your kindness. And we just want to tell you thank you, Lord, because you didn't have to do what you did, but yet you did it, Lord. And we just want to tell you we thank you, Father. So I pray, Lord, bless right now the moment that we're in. Lord, the people of God are prepared to receive the word from you, Lord. So I pray, Lord God, that you have your way. I right now, by my own free will, remove myself from the equation by giving the Holy Spirit the power of attorney over the message that you are about to give to your people. Help us, Lord, that we may set, Lord God, with a spirit of expectation to hear what it is that you have set before us. Forgive us, Lord, for anything we may have done, doing, or, Lord, anything that is not pleasing in your sight, that our minds may not be cluttered with mess. Help us to remove any distraction in any way, form, or fashion that we may stay focused on that which you are calling us to do. Oh, Father, I pray that you bless us that we may have an ear to hear what the Spirit of the Lord has to say and obey that which the Spirit says unto us. Bless those that are here with us right now, Lord, that they may be in the moment ready to receive thy word. To those that will be joining us shortly, help them to get to a safe place that they may be able to view the message, Lord God, and receive everything you have in it for them and for those that will not be here with us today for whatever reason. We pray, Father, that you bless them, that they stay at it, and at a later day, view this message to be able to see what is it that you have laid in this word for them. We thank you and we honor you, Lord, for who you are and all that you have done. In Jesus' name, we ask you, Lord God, and believe by faith that you have heard this request to honor this, Lord, by blessing us and giving us a word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Now, with that said, saints, um, with that said, we just want to thank God and honor God for the opportunity we have. So in X. The tw um, Acts the 23rd chapter. We had just finished up Acts the 23rd chapter, so we're going to briefly go over that and then go into new information that we have. Let me remove the church that's coming in. So, so, so what we're going to do, guys, we're going to go into the Word of God. It's in Acts the 29th, uh, Acts the 23rd chapter, verse number 29. It says, Whom I perceive to be accused of questioning of their law, but to have nothing lied to their charge worthy of death lied to his charge, worthy of death or of bonds. And when it was told me how that the Jews lied in wait for the man, I sent straightway for thee and gave commandment to his accusers also to say before thee what they have against him. Farewell. And so what, well, we'll just touch rest up before we move forward. Then the, soldier, then the soldiers as it was commanded them, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipathus. On the morrow they lied the on the on the morrow they left the horsemen to go with him and return to the castle. Who, when they came to Caesarea and delivered the epistle to the governor, pre pre presented Paul also before them. And when the governor had read read the letter and asked of what province he was. And he and when he had 
understood that he was of Cilicia, I will hear thee, said he, when thy accusers also, when thy accusers are also come, and he come and he commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. Now, what we're gonna have to do is I'm gonna settle myself here, guys. A lot of things going on, but let's just touch bases on what we had last week. And what he was saying again, we was touching bases with um with the chief captain, what had taken place is the chief captain um, had gotten Paul to safety and he had just given a huge uh, wave of soldiers to get Paul to where, we go, where he needed to go. And the week before last, we learned that he had 200 spearmen, 200 um, soldiers, and another 70 horsemen to get Paul to where he was going. Then put Paul on a horse that if anything happened, while the soldiers were taking care of business, they was able to get Paul to safety. And so that's why um, the the chief captain was saying in 29, who I perceived to accuse the um, accuse of questioning their law, but was nothing lied to his charge worthy of death or bonds. They wanted to kill Paul. So he was saying when I looked at what they was um, all upset about, there was not enough to even put the man in prison, not let's kill him. And so what he was saying is, no, nah, we're not going to do this. So he told them in verse number 30, and he says, and when it was told me how that the Jews lied in wait um, for the man, I sent straightway to, straightway to thee and gave commandment to the accusers also to say before thee what they had against him Farewell. So he was telling as he was sending um, this letter, the chief captain was sending this letter to, letter to the governor, Felix. He was saying, I'm giving you all of the information. I need you to be up to snuff to what's going on. He says, and um, as he was beginning to just let him know, and I'm also going to send his accusers or let the accusers know you have a right to show up in court to uh, plead your case before the governor. And he says, you know, of course, in closing, farewell. And the soldiers got about their business to get, the Paul, get Paul to where he needed to be. And the next day, what he said is they separated when the 200 soldiers, um, the 400 soldiers and spearmen went one way while the 70 um, went on with Paul. And the point they was making was because it was a hot spot when word came to the the chief captain, that these 70 men was laying and waiting for Paul, which would have then opened up a major problem because soldiers would have then been hurt, which then left um, left Rome really upset because soldiers would have been killed, hurt, and that province, the, the wrath of Rome would have came down on them. And so he was telling them, um, when you get the Caesarea, deliver this epistle to the governor, present Paul um, also before him. So he's saying not only the letter, but the man that the letter is talking about is right there. And when the governor had read the letter, he asked him of what province he was, and he understood that it was of Cilicia. So what he's saying is, okay, I know where this is coming from. I know what this is about. And he's saying, um, I'm going to hear you out. But what we're going to do is we're going to wait for the people in the letter that was stated. They were coming also to make their case. And so what he's saying is we're going to wait for all this and then what we'll do from there is be able to um, be able to go forward from there to find out exactly what is it that um, what is it that is going on and how do we give a good judgment of whatever is going on. And so what we are learning and we found out was um, the governor. The chief captain was saying, there's nothing to see here. This is a lot to do about nothing. And so many times we'll try to get in the way of God and try to plead our own case and fight and try to make people make sense. And as I often say, and teach the firm foundation, y'all know this by now, that you are not dealing with a face, a place, or a voice. You are dealing with a spirit. And as I said last week, people's mindset is, don't bother me with facts. My mind is made up. When a person do not want to see what you are saying, there is no way you can explain it that they're going to understand it because they do not want to understand it. They're not interested in understanding it. And so when you find these type people, they're not waiting at all um, to hear truth. They're waiting for you to make a mistake or they're just waiting for you to take a breath so they can talk. And so in those situations, you do not waste your time on situations like that. That's why the Lord says, don't give that which is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before the swine. So what God is saying, when you see a, pe a person or a people that do not want the truth, or people that do not want to hear reason, don't waste your time. Do not waste your time because they're not going to hear you. And so that's what was taking place there. So this thing has elevated up in the ranks of what was going on. And so the chief captain has a vested interest in this because, one, Paul had dual citizenship. We learned that. 
Paul had dual citizenship. He was a Jew and he was a Roman. And so by having dual citizenship, when the Jews tried to kill him, Felix, um, I think it was Felix had to go. I'm not sure if it was Felix. Uh, I think, well, the chief captain had to go and jump in and protect him. And we're going to find out the chief captain got a little physical with these guys just to deal with this because his job was to protect them, to make sure. But his job was to get Paul because Paul wanted, when he found out that Paul was a Roman and he had been beaten uncondemned, there's going to be repercussions for what has happened. So we move now into new information, guys. So that's what we had going on. So in, now in Acts, the 24th chapter, we are starting. So they have made their journey and they have gotten to this where they're able to um, go forward with what is going on. Now, a little space had passed because not only did they send the soldiers and everything, but they had to wait until the chief, uh, until the uh, Pharisees and all of them got there to plead a case to see which way they're going to go with a thing. And so your job in a situation like that is to pray and hear from God. They may have you set up on your job. They may have you set up in your community. They may, it may even be your spouse that seems like they got you dead to rights on something. And you know for a fact that is not true what is being said. Your job is to hold your peace and let God do the fighting of the battle. And that's why you should acknowledge God asking him. That's why the word says in all your ways acknowledge him. He's going to direct your path. Sometimes these snares and traps are so crafty. They have done such a good job. There is no way out. But one thing you need to understand. You with everybody fighting for you is at a disadvantage. But God, you and God fighting for you, you are at an advantage. So you trust God, regardless of what it looked like or how well they don't craft this plan or how many good liars they have to back up what it is that they're doing. Understand that God will have the last say-so in this matter. So we saying now, what we, there's more time and it's the most worst thing. So what we have here and you're looking at um, God's word in um, Acts 20, Acts 24, 1. And it says, it says, and after five days, Ananias, the high priest, descended with the elders and with a certain orator named Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. Now, this is what we're saying now, after five days, and that lets you know there was a space of time from the time that the governor received the letter and receive um, Paul. There was a space of time, which meaning the, again, um, and after five days, Ananias, the high priest, descended on descended with the elders. So you have all of these religious leaders. Now that right there sends a message to Rome that something major is going on here because not only did the high priest come, but also all of the elders with him. And they came, not only that, now they wasn't going to speak for themselves. And I'm always suspicious. I'm always suspicious when you cannot um, form what it is that you are, um, your complaint is. Listen at what he says in the latter part. It says, and with a certain orator named to tell us. So they brought their mouthpiece, their lawyer, if you will. So they brought their mouthpiece to be able to speak to them. And when you have someone that's bringing that, what they're intending to do is to try to butter up the people that they're talking to. When you got to bring a, a professional speaker in, um, in a situation like this, it's almost like me and you have a disagreement, but I ain't going to say that. I'm going to let this person speak for me. And wait a minute. The disagreement is with you and I. Come, let us reason together, the word tells us. And so with Tertullus there to speak, uh, um, Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. So it was Tertullus that saw, began to start speaking and tell the governor all of these issues and coming at Paul. So they made this, they went from pretty much from a religious thing to they put it pretty much in a legal standing or legal fashion. And that's what you have. So you pretty much have your prosecuting attorney and you have your witnesses and you have your, um, your, uh, Paul would be the defense. He's going to have to defend himself. So you have his accusers, the prosecuting attorney, and you have, um, witnesses, if you will. And that's all you will find in verse number one. So after five days, they got their crew together. You took the head man and all of the elders and you came with a certain uh, mouthpiece to speak for you and um, you informed the governor of everything that you wanted them to hear. Now, in a court of law, the way it should be is you have an, um, 
if you would, a prosecutor, that's the person that's trying to get you, a defender, that's yourself. And it's backwards here because they are making the accusation. They are the ones making the accusation, but they brought them a lawyer. Now, Paul is the one being accused. He should have been the one that had a lawyer. But when God is for you, who can be against you? Now, that is to say a lot of people can be against you, but it will not prosper. It will not win. And so what you have to realize and recognize in this whole situation, they have, they have brought their A-team, if you will, to go after Paul. And so Tertullus is beginning to speak to um, the, um, speak to Felix and tell Felix all about what is going on and what he's dealing with and why they are so upset. But look at the way he comes. Now, you always have to be suspicious of a person that comes in this matter. I don't care who they are. The saying goes, you keep your friends close, but you keep your enemies closer. And that is to say, guys, a person really, well, that is to say you got to keep an eye on the people, um, the people that are really after you. You can't just discard them. You got to know which way they're going, how they're moving. You got to be able to know which they are, who they are networking with. If you don't know what your enemy is doing, you don't know what your enemy is um, doing. You don't know what your enemy is capable of. And so God tell you, that's why he tell you to be wise as a serpent, but homeless as a dog. One thing about a snake, a snake will sit and watch you. Do you know there are times when you are standing right beside a snake and the snake will not move? I mean, you are literally standing beside the snake and the snake will not move. And the moment you walk off, your peripheral vision may catch and that snake moving out the way. And you may say, you say, well, that snake was right there. So the snake was already near you. So when he's saying this, um, be he says, be wise as a serpent. But harmless as a dog, you got to know what your enemies are up to and who they're moving with to come after you. So you have some kind of um, understanding of what is going on. Now, God, what he's going to do, he's going to take care of you. He's going to reveal your enemies and the way their plans are. But you're going to have to know something about what you're dealing with. Quick um, side note, I'm saying, I don't care how good your team is. If you are a football team, and I'll just use this for an example, um, I'm going to say um, that team... Um, America do a lot of bragging about, but then they never win nothing. Let's say that team, and they, but they just watch them at practice, and, and if they coaches only just watch them, or they spy on uh, scouts only just watch them, you would think we got the best team in the world. But then what happens when you play somebody? Our team lose. So the thing is, you have to know your enemy. You have to know what they're capable of, so you'll know how to deal with them. So going to verse number two, it says. And when he had called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, seeing that, now this is something you need to pay attention. Remember now, just going back to the latter part of B, it says, at the end part, it says, who informed the governor against Paul. And then verse number two, it says, and when he, and when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence. So what he's saying is, oh, he started with buttering them up. See, you got to be careful of the person that butter you up because that's the one that's getting the knife close to your back. And so he's speaking to Felix and listen what he said. He immediately started to build in this eagle, making them feel good because it is a proven fact. When a person makes you feel good, you're more susceptible to them meaning you'll open up to hear them or you will kind of let your guard down. I would pray that Felix have seen this many, many times, understand what they were doing. So listen to what he's saying. He says again, and when he was called, and when he was called for who? To tell us. So Felix says, okay, come on. Let me hear, let me hear what you have to say. Let me hear your part. He says, um, to tell us begin to accuse him. Who? Paul. So he began to go in to make his case as to why. Paul, they should have access to Paul saying, seeing that that were actually, he was beginning here, he was beginning to butter up Felix. Again, saying, seeing that, that, seeing that by thee, we enjoy great quietness. So everything is calm. You got everything in order here. I mean, because of you, everything is just there's order and there is no chaos. And you don't want chaos. And this man is going to bring chaos. And you say, well, how are you reading all of that into this? Well, that's because I studied this already in advance. But nevertheless, that's what he is saying. Saying, um, again, seeing that, seeing that by thee, we enjoy quietness. Because of you, you have order. 
And see, when things are not in order, you have chaos, which means everything is in an uproar. He says, and that and, and that very worthy deeds are done unto that, this nation by thy prophet. So what he said, because of you, this nation have a lot of good things going for it. It is your hand. See, everybody loves to be pat on the back and praised. And so what he is starting to do is buttering up to him. And a wise, person, a wise leader would have been like, okay, can you get to it? It's just like your kid. If your kid comes to you and say to you, um, you just look at your kid and say, you know what? Mom, how did dad get you? You are such a beautiful woman. But dad, you no slouch yourself. I have some good looking parents. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What you want, boy? See, that's the question you're going to ask because they're up to something. They start by buttering you up, trying to get you on their side. And so that's what was taking place. The talents was telling, I was beginning to speak because he had already in verse one was beginning to accuse Paul. Then in verse two, he began to start buttering up um, Felix to tell him how good he is about things. And he says, um, Again, you have all of this stuff in order. Your provinces, you got it quiet. You, we, we, there's great benefits because you are ruling. There's no crime in the streets. None of this stuff is, um, everything is lined up the way, the way it should be because of you. It's all because of you. And in verse number three, it says, we accept it, we accept it always. Because of you, all these things in order. And we are happy with that. We are very happy with that. And in all places, most noble Felix with all thankfulness. So because of you, all over this place, it's all in order. We don't have no chaos. We have none of that. And we are saying all through this place, it's all in order. And we just want to say, noble Felix, oh, great man you are. We say thank you. Thank you. My goodness, what would it be been like if somebody else had this problem? We would have war all over the place. But because of you, these are people that would try to butter you up especially as pastors, you have to be very careful with people that come to the church and God sent me here. And you are the man of God. And, and I know that thou art great. What is it that you watch that person? Because they have a hidden agenda and ulterior motives. That's not the way a normal person speak. That's not the way people come at the people just speak to you normally. So when you have a person in your life that always butter you up to set you on, on a pedestal, look out for that person. That's the one that's got the knife that's trying to get close to you. If you never let yourself get set up, you can never get let down. Hey, that'll preach. Hey. So what you have to do is trust God every step of the way and believe him. So that's what he did. He has already started out with jumping on Paul. He then began to lift up, um, lift up um, Felix, who he's talking to, trying to butter up, if you would, the judge. And then he is saying, you have always kept everything in order. And we are so thankful for that. We are so thankful. Now, all of the ones that's been causing all the chaos is the ones sitting there saying they're thankful that it ain't no um, chaos. Well, of course it ain't no chaos when you ain't acting up. And so what you have to do is trust God every step of the way. And this he says, notwithstanding. Now, with all that that he's saying, he says, notwithstanding, that I be not, um, that I not be further tedious of, or tedious of thee. I pray thee that thou wouldest hear us of thy, thy calamity and a few words. Okay, I, I'm sorry. Um, hear, hear us of thy clemency a few words. So what he is saying here, um, he is saying with all of that that he is saying, what he, all that buttering up he just finished doing, he's saying but with all of that, nevertheless, when you hear a nevertheless after a person on Buttered you up when you hear nevertheless, and that's what he said, notwithstanding, nevertheless, but um, all those in the same words. So when a person has said a lot of all these good things and you hear a but or a nevertheless or notwithstanding, they just canceled out everything they just said. Now, this is what we're here for. So with all that they said to Felix and buttering him up, nevertheless, what he's saying, that I be no further te um, um, tedious of the uh, thee. He's saying, I pray thee that thou would have hear us of thy clemency a few words. So what he's saying, so what he's saying is now that we have talked with you, I'm not going to hold you much longer. I'm not going to bother you. But I want you to hear a thing. Here's a concern we have. There is a problem. We need your hand. We need your take. So we need you to give your um, 
your, we need you to just hear our case so you'll understand what we're upset and mad about. So we're not going to be, I'm not going to just, you know, how people, you're sitting and someone talking, you're like, please just get to it. Please, would you just get to it? And that's what he's saying it, guys. That's why he's saying it. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be tedious unto thee. I'm not going to just wear your patience down. I want you to get about it and go from there. And so that's what he's saying and pushing there. So what the thing is, guys, when you have a person and they're just getting about the business that they're in, don't draw this thing out because people already have a short tension span. Sometimes you need to understand the moment and get to it. Because when you're dealing with spiritual things, there's nothing, the devil is waiting for anything to get a person in a state to where they, um, if they would, were not to hear you. And when you're too long with a thing, a person cut you off. But when you let the spirit just have his way and you just start talking, not real flat, uh, a fast talker, but a person you're just talking to, okay, people will go along with that, but well, that makes sense or understand you there. But when you will just draw out the patience of a person, you will find that um, people would um, just turn you off and you're just babbling now to them. He says, for we have found this, we have found this man, a pestilent fellow, a mover, uh, he says, a, a mover of seditions amongst all the Jews throughout the whole, throughout the world and a ringleader of the sick of the Nazarene. So this is what he is saying here. So this is, um, this is to tell us, and he's talking to Felix, and he's saying, here's what our concern is. This is what we're upset about. He has gotten to the crux of the matter now, which says in verse number five again, says, we have found this man a pestilent fellow. What he said, this is a troublemaker. This is a problem. We have found this problem, child. And he says, a problem child, and a mover of sedition, um, a mover of seditions amongst um, the Jews throughout the whole world. What he's saying is, every time you see there's a stir up with the Jews. Now, he was, what's the word? Because he wasn't lying, but he was, he was, he, what is it? You're not lying, but you're not giving the truth either. You're not. Well, what he's doing is misrepresenting. That's what he's doing. So you can say a thing, but it's not in the context what you said it. And the person said, well, you did say that. Recall from me one time, it was just fun. Sometimes I just have fun with these things. But there was a, um, there was a person that called me on the phone. And these people said, well, are you Robert? And I said, yes, I am. I said, well, well no, I was careful not to say yes. I would not say yes. In this conversation. And I don't know. I just felt the umption of the Holy Spirit not to say yes. And so the person was saying, um, are you Robert? I was like, and who's calling? And the person told me who they was. And he asked me a question. And it was a yes or no question. But I would not say yes. And he got frustrated because I wouldn't say yes. And he was saying, okay, all you have to say is yes or no. I said, so that's all I have to say? He said, yes, that's all you have to say. I said, okay. He said, um, he asked me the question. I was like, now, I do agree with that. He was like, no, no, say yes. No, I'm not going to say that. And here's why. Here's why. And I found out what the Holy Spirit was warning me of. If you said yes, then they can then take that and cut it and loop it and put it on whatever you want to. They can say, um, you, they can say something and you say, well, yes. And making you say something you did not say. And so what you were looking at is that's what they were doing right there. They was taking, they wanted, he's saying, this is a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition amongst all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazareans. What he's saying, this is the person that's causing all the problems with the Jews, which is true because everywhere Paul went, they stirred up problems. It wasn't Paul stirring up the problems. It was them because they did not want to hear the word. And that's why Paul was chased from city to city, out of town to town, one province to another one. Because the Jews, they even had people to follow him and do one or two things. We learned earlier in Acts 1, when Paul got to where he was going and after he finished teaching, they could not debate with him in the word. They couldn't debate with him in the word. So what they did is when he left, they would then sit and confuse the people. That's what they would do. They would sit and they would confuse the people. 
But when they would sit there with Paul, they would stir up trouble and just start screaming and yelling and have all this um, break out. And so what then would have to happen is the Roman soldiers would have to come in and break up everything and pull Paul away or lock him up or whatever they did. But the point is the devil just don't want the gospel to be preached. So that's why you got to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dog. Meaning you got to figure out the people that are around you and proclaiming the word of God. And so that's what he was saying. Everywhere you go is a problem. Well, that's because y'all are always the ones stirring up the problems. That's why they're able to say that. And he's saying he is a, a ringleader of the sick, of the Nazarene, which is true because Jesus was of Nazareth and he's talking about Jesus. And so what he is saying is Paul is a ringleader, which is an apostle, which that was true, but they was using it in a negative way. They was using it in a very negative way. He says, whom also had gone about to profane the temple, whom we took and would have judged according to our laws. So what he's saying is not only laying out the things he said, not, long, not only is he a pestilent fellow, meaning a problem, he says, but he's a mover of seditions amongst the Jews. So he keeps trouble stirred up. And he is a ringleader of this sect, which is Nazareth. Nazarene. So what they're saying, in essence, what he's saying is, you have always had a Rome, if you would, keeps peace. That's all Rome wanted. I told you, Rome, it was two things that Rome wanted. They wanted the taxes and they wanted peace. And so what you're looking at there, they were saying, you know, these, he gave you this litany of things that Paul uh, accused of by them of doing. And to some, um, some points that is true, but it's not in the context which they're saying. It is not in the context. Paul kept peace with everybody. He would sit down and talk with him, willing to reason with people for hours at a time. Not argue, but sit down and listen to them and show them why what they are believing is an error and showing them the more perfect way. And that's why you have to be skilled in the word of God that you may know exactly. You may know exactly what it is that God is doing on your behalf. And so that's what he's saying. Who are, so they, he gave you this whole litany of things. He's a troublemaker. He's stirring up problems. He is teaching. He's a ringleader and co pretty much coming against Rome. They're throwing everything at him. He says, who also being gone about to, gone about, who also gone about to profane the, to profane the temple whom we took and would have judged according to our laws. So all the stuff he done, we wouldn't even be here before you. But what we did is you can see that this guy profaned our laws. We would have handled it according to our laws. That's what we were doing. We was finna judge him properly. We was finna make sure he was, you know, <laughs> um, dealt with properly. It's so funny because when you read, they lying. They are telling white face lies. They just flat out lying. Now, mind you, these are the religious people. What do you do when the people that's supposed to have the character are the ones that's doing all the lying and looking at you, the person they claim to have no character, and want you to abide by a law which they will not abide by? It is amazing to me the same, the very people that will not do what they're supposed to do look at you and try to get mad at you because you are doing what you're supposed to do. So they're saying we would have judged them according to our laws. We would have judged them, but they took the laws and twisted them to make them what they want to make them. Guys, I got to keep it. Oh, ah. we'll go with the last verse. Last verse, guys, with Tommy. It says, But the chief captain Lysias came unto us and with great violence took him away out of our hands. Oh, we had this thing, Felix. We had we were gonna judge him according to our laws, we were gonna give him a trial. Yeah, right. We were going to give him a fair trial, and we were going you know, we, we were going to, and, and we had all this laid out, and here come Lysias, he's going to just come in and, and with great violence. And he caused the uproar. Now, we know he's lying. We know he's lying, because back in Acts, and I think it's like verse number 30, it said they was trying to kill Paul. And so the chief captain had to sin. He had to send um, soldiers down there to get him because he understood that Paul was a Roman. And so he was protecting one of their citizens, one, and he was also keeping the peace. And so, yeah, those soldiers had to go down there and crack a few heads because it was a uproar. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, in the 20, 23rd chapter, if you look back, 23rd chapter, about the, 
I'll tell you what, we'll go back. We're not going any further than this, guys. Okay. So Acts the 23rd chapter. And we're going to go back and say, but probably about verse number. Okay, it says, and um, and called unto me to, yeah. I mean, to such a reason, soldiers, back a little bit. And the chief captain left them, left them and departed. And, well, and that one of the councils to find a captain to bring down the. Okay, and so this what it was actually it was in the earlier part of of um, verse twenty three. Um, verse number nine it says and there arose a cry and the Sadducees where they divided between one another. Actually, guys. Okay. Before God until this day. So actually, um, we're going back a little further. It was in 22 to where at the latter part of 22, when Paul had began to um where they brought up a where a riot and they was trying to kill Paul because he would not um in any way, form, or fashion adhere to what it is that they wanted. And so what we had taking place is Paul was saying, well, no. This is what we're going to have to, um, they were saying we're going to kill him. And so the chief captain had to come in and remove Paul for safety. Now these liars are standing before the governor because remember, you went from the chief captain to um, Lysias to um, now they're standing before Felix. And so the latter keep going up and they're standing before greater authority and power. And they're saying, and we was there and we would have judged them according to our laws, but your man wouldn't let us. And that's what he's saying. Pretty much your man would not let us. And so therefore, we are here. That's what they're putting for. So guys, that's where we're at today. And I pray for you. Please, I pray that you, please give me some leniency. The enemy is going to do what the enemy is supposed to do. But I have to learn to stay focused more on what it is that God has called me to do, regardless of the situation. My wife tells me all the time, you need to stay focused on what you have to do. The devil's going to do what the devil's going to do. The devil's going to devil. Okay? He's going to do his job. He's going to do his job. And then you're fine in the midst of all of that, that God will be of great, um, great reward on your behalf if you just trust him through this. So what we have learned in the midst of all of this is God had taken in the midst of it all. Now he has us in front of a proper group of people where the case can be heard. Now we have heard them make their case and we have heard what they have to say. But when you have a true court, then what will take place is you get to have your say-so. And when you honor God and obey God, I promise you, you will get to have your say-so. Father, we thank you and we bless you and we honor you for this time that we have had in your word. I pray, Lord, that you bless us, that we are able to take that word that we have learned and apply it to our lives. Oh, Father, my Father, I plead the blood of Jesus that you may bless us, that we have an ear to hear what the Spirit has to say and then obey that which the Spirit has told us. Oh, Lord, bless us that even in the confusion that you do not let your word be missed. Help us that we may stay focused on your word. Help us that we may abide in your law, your will, and your way. Help us that we do not allow the word that you have allowed us to hear tonight to go wasted. But help us, Lord, that we may take it and apply it to our lives, that we may grow. Oh, Father, bless your sons, that they may continue to abide in your word, Hear what it is that you have to say to them, for them, and about them, that we may all, Lord, grow in thee. Now, for doing this, Lord, we're careful to give your name to praise, the glory, and the honor. For this is a prayer we ask the Holy Spirit to deliver to the Father. For it is both in the name and under the blood of our Lord and our Savior. For you are Jesus. You are the Christ. Saints, thank you for the time that we've had. And any time in teaching in the Word of God, we're curious about something. We want to know flat out. It's all about growing in the word. The question is asked. All you want out there and have heard the word of God and you say this, it just applies to me. I hear God talking to me. I have fought many times trying to fight many people to get them to understand or explain um, so I can explain myself better. But no one wants to listen and I'm angry. And so I've always been one I'm going to fight for myself. But I hear what you're saying today, Lord, and I'm tired of fighting for me, so I want you to fight for me. So I want to be a part of the kingdom of God. I want to be a part of the family of God. So the question I have to you is this. 
Are you one that do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and would like to know him as your Lord and Savior? If you are one that don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and would like to know him as your Lord and Savior, I have some very good news for you. I want to walk you through God's plan of salvation. If you are that person, I want you to come and walk with me. But before we move further, let me ask, is there anyone here that once knew Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And you turned and walked away. And you would like to now rededicate your life to Christ. That he may be the Lord thereof. Come and walk with me. Just repeat after me. Say, Father, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for this door. I thank you for the way that you have made me. I right now, of my own free will, choose to walk therein. By saying, Father, forgive me for the life of sin which I have been living. Forgive me, Lord, for living your life my way. Lord, I pray that you hear my cry. Lord, I ask you, Jesus, by my own free will, would you come into my life, sit on the throne of my heart, and save me. I accept you, Lord, as my Lord and my Savior. Bless this, your servant, Lord that I may walk according to your law, your will, and your way. Thank you, Father, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have prayed that prayer, we say welcome to the family of Almighty God. Welcome home. If you have made that confession, guys, and you are walking now in, um, the, light of, in the life of light, um, let us know. Would you put it in the comment section? Just let us know that you have given your life to Christ and you're not saved. We just want to celebrate with you. Now you may ask, what do I do now that I have given my life to Christ? Well, you get in a good Bible-believing church and you obey the word of God. Now you may ask, I, well, I'm not sure what that is. Well, just stay right here with us. Stay right here with us and we will walk you through God's plan of salvation. Or walk you through God's plan for salvation now that you are, have given your life to Christ. Now, you may say, okay, but I want to be a part of Firm Foundation. What do I need to do to be a part of this ministry? Well, two things. We ask you, one, we ask you, do you believe that the Bible is the infallible word of God? Do you believe the Bible to be true? You say, yes, I do believe the Bible to be true. Okay, the second thing is, are you willing to obey the rules and the regulation of this ministry? So as long as they line up with the word of God. You say, I'm willing to do that. Well, we'll say, well, then... Welcome to Firm Foundation Outreach Ministry, a ministry that loves everyone right where they are and work with them to get them to where Christ wants them to be. Now, you may say, okay, then, um, I want to be, I want to, you know, come visit you guys and be a part of the ministry, the part of the service. I just want to see everyone shake a hand, give a hug. Well, we're located at 1851 Highway 66 South in Kernersville, North Carolina. If you are um, near, we would love to see your face. We start service on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. and um, Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. Bar no technical difficulties. So you may say, okay, then I would like to come and visit you guys. But I want to support the ministry while I'm at it. We say then go to firmfoundationoutreach.org. There's a QR code you can give there or you can take a snail mail. Located again, 1851 Highway 66 South in Kernersville. If you want to mail it that way, I assure you, saints, every dime will be used for the kingdom of God's sake. No shady business. We want to thank you for the time that we have had in the word. Prayerfully, um, something you got to receive and bless you along the way. In Jesus' name, be blessed.